Second Harvest Talent is perhaps nothing other than successfully sublimated rage, the capacity to convert energies once intensified beyond measure to destroy recalcitrant objects into the concentration of patient observation, so keeping as tight a hold on the secret of things as one had earlier when finding no peace until the quavering voice had been wrenched from the mutilated toy. Who is not seen on the face of a man sunk in thought, far removed from practical objects, traits of the same aggression which is otherwise exerted practi practically? Does not the artist feel himself, amid the transports of creation, brutalized, working furiously? Indeed is not such fury necessary to free oneself from confinement, and the fury of confinement? Might not the very conciliatoriness of art have been only bullied out of its destructiveness. Nowadays, most people kick with the pricks. How some things have gestures, and so modes of behavior inscribed in them. Slippers are designed to be slipped into without help from the hand. They are monuments to the hatred of bending down. That in repressive society, freedom comes to the same thing as insolence is demonstrated by the nonchalant gestures of teenagers, who don't care a cent for the world, as long as they do not sell it their labor. To show that they are dependent on no one, and so owe no one respect, they put their hands in their trouser pockets, but their elbows stuck outwards are ready to barge anyone who, go, who gets in their way. A German is someone who cannot tell a lie without believing it himself. The phrase, kommt überhaupt gar nicht in Frag, it's completely and utterly out of the question, which probably came into use in Berlin in the 20s, is already potentially Hitler's seizure of power. For it pretends that private will, founded sometimes on real rights, but usually on mere effrontery, directly represents an objective necessity that admits no disagreement. At bottom, it is the refusal of a bankrupt negotiator to pay the other a farthing, and the proud awareness that there is nothing more to be got out of him. The crooked lawyer's dodge is brazenly inflated to heroic steadfastness, the linguistic formula for usurpation. This bluff defines equally the success and the collapse of national socialism. The existence of bread factories turning the prayer that we be given our daily bread into a mere metaphor and an avowal of desperation argues more strongly against the possibility of Christianity than all the enlightened critiques of the life of Jesus. Anti-Semitism is the rumor about the Jews. German words of foreign derivation are the Jews of language. One evening, in a mood of, hel of helpless sadness, I caught myself using a ridiculously wrong subjunctive form of a verb that was itself not entirely correct German, being part of the dialect of my native town. I had not heard, let alone used, the endearing misconstruction since my first years at school. Melancholy, drawing me irresistibly into the abyss of childhood, awakened this old, impotently yearning sound in its depths. Language sent back to me like an echo of the humiliation which unhappiness had inflicted on me in forgetting what I am. The second part of Faust, decreed as obscure and allegorical, is more crammed with commonly used quotations than any play except William Tell. The transparency and simplicity of a text bears no direct relation to its capacity to enter tradition. It may be its very impenetrability, demanding constantly renewed interpretation, that confers on a sentence or a work the authority which dedicates it to posterity. Every work of art is an uncommitted crime, Tragedies which, by means of style, most strictly maintain a distance from mere existence, at the same time most faithfully preserve with their communal processions, masks, and sacrifices the memory of the de demonology of primitive man. The, po the poverty of the sunrise in Richard Strauss' Alpine Symphony results not only from its banal uh, sequences, but from its very splendor. For no sunrise, even in mountains, is pompous, triumphal, imperial. Each one is faint and timorous, like a hope that all may yet be well.
and it is this very unobtrusiveness of the mightiest light that is moving and overpowering. The sound of any woman's voice on the telephone tells us whether the speaker is attractive. It reflects back a self-confidence, natural ease and self-tension, all the admiring and desirous glances she has ever received. It expresses the double meaning of graciousness, gratitude, and grace. The ear perceives what is for the eye, because both live on the experience of a single beauty. It is recognized on first hearing, a familiar quotation from a book never read. Waking in the middle of a dream, even the worst, one feels disappointed, cheated of the best in life. But pleasant, fulfilled dreams are actually as rare, to use Schubert's words, as happy music. Even the loveliest dream bears like a blemish its difference from reality, the awareness that what it grants is mere illusion. This is why precisely the loveliest dreams are as if blighted. Such an impression is captured superlatively in the description of the nature theater of Oklahoma and Kafka's America. To happiness, the same applies as to truth. One does not have it, but is in it. Indeed, happiness is nothing other than being encompassed, an after image of the original shelter within the mother. But for this reason, no one who is happy can know that he is so. To see happiness, he would have to pass out of it, to be as if already born. He who says he is happy lies and in invoking happiness sins against it. He alone keeps faith who says, I was happy. The only relation of consciousness to happiness is gratitude, in which lies its incomparable dignity. To a child returning from a holiday, home seems new, fresh, festive. Yet nothing has changed there since he left, only because duty has now been forgotten, of which each piece of furniture, window, lamp was otherwise a reminder. Is the house given back the Sabbath peace? And for minutes, one is at home in a never-returning world of rooms, nooks and corridors, in a way that makes the rest of life there a lie. No differently will, will the world one day appear almost unchanged in its constant feast day light, when it stands no longer under the law of labor, and when for homecomers duty has the lightness of holiday play. Now that we can no longer pluck flowers to adorn our beloved, a sacrifice that adoration for the one atones by freely taking on itself the wrong it does all others, picking flowers has become something evil. It serves only to perpetuate the transient by fixing it. But nothing is more ruinous. The scentless bouquet, the institutionalized remembrance, kills what still lingers by the very act of preserving it. The fleeting moment can live in the murmur of forgetfulness, that the ray will one day touch to brightness. The moment we want to possess is lost already. The luxurious blooms that the child struggles home with at the mother's command might be stuck behind the mirror as artificial ones were 60 years ago and in the end they become the greedily seized holiday snapshot in which the landscape is littered with those who saw nothing of it, and who grab as a souvenir something that sank unremembered into nothingness. But he who in rapture sends flowers will reach instinctively for the ones that look mortal. We owe our life to the difference between the economic framework of late capitalism and its political facade. To theoretical criticism, the discrepancy is slight, Everywhere the sham character of supposed public opinion, the primacy of the economy and real decisions can be demonstrated. For countless individuals, however, the thin ephem <clears throat> ephemeral veil is the basis of their entire existence. Precisely those on whose thought and action change, alone essential, depends are indebted for their existence to the inessential illusion. Indeed, to what? measured by the great laws of historical development, amounts to mere chance. But is not the whole construction of essence and appearance thereby affected? Measured by its concept, the individual has indeed become as null and void as Hegel's philosophy anticipated. Seen subspecie individu individuations, however, absolute contingency permitted to persist as a seemingly, seemingly abnormal state is itself the essential. The world is systematized horror, but therefore it is to do the world too much honor to think of it entirely as a system. For its unifying principle is division, and it reconciles by asserting unimpaired the irreconcilability of the general and the particular. Its essence is abomination, but its appearance, the lie by virtue of which it persists, 
It's a stand-in for truth.